How are you all doing today? You ready for the Word of God? Amen. Why don't you open your Bibles? We're going to be in the book of Genesis today. Genesis chapter 1. We are on the series, the first chapter, and uh, we're talking about a lot of different foundational truths, foundational passages. We're talking about uh, kind of these things that before we enter into the next season, we need to make sure those foundations are right. Those foundations are first. And, and I think there's no better place to go for foundational passages than Genesis chapter 1. Literally the first page in your Bible, okay? So if you have a hard time finding books in the Bible, this one should be an easy one. Don't worry, we're not going to Haggai this week. We're going to Genesis 1. Amen to that. Let me pray for the word. Lord, this is your word. Ignite in us a passion, inspiration, conviction. Challenge us, comfort us, change us, Lord. Let your word come alive like it always does. Every single week, it sharpens us. It does things that no mere human thought or creativity could do. It captures our hearts and our souls, and it changes us. Lord, will you break hardenings today? Will you change our minds about things today? I pray that traditions would be broken in Jesus' name today. I pray that previous thought patterns that are unhealthy would be broken in Jesus' name. Let us come into life with you and life abundantly. In your name, amen. Amen. Well, I originally, I wanted to start with verse 3. We have a lot we're going to read today. We're going to kind of do a little speed reading through this. A little speed reading. Um, but I felt really challenged uh, before starting in verse 3 to start from the very beginning. I think the Lord has something prophetically maybe to say here. So let, let's just see what, he, what, let's see what his word has to say. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says this. In the beginning, God... I love that. Wrap your mind around that for a second. In the beginning, God. He is preeminent. He is before all things. All things come before him and through him. Excuse me. God is above all things and before all things. And I feel like if we really wrapped our mind around this, if we actually wrapped our mind, I think the things of this world really wouldn't trouble us that much. Literally everything came through God. He was before, there was nothing, and there was God. That's it. He's the boss man. And when you're praying to him, and you're talking to him, and if you wrap your mind around that, that before everything, in the beginning, there was just him, it could change your whole life. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. God created everything, science as we know it, physics as we know it, the world, how it operates as we know it. It's God. It's God. It was God before anything else. It was just God. He created every single thing. And it says this now, verse 2, the earth was formless, empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the waters. So the earth was just voidless, it was barren, and all there was was some water. Can you imagine how eerie it would be on the earth at this time? I know we think about this like, it's, like we're uh, 100,000 feet above, like we think of the planet earth like that, but imagine being on the earth when it's formless, when it's void, when there's, there's just craters and dust, but there's no dirt, and it's just dark, and it's cold waiting to be a canvas for God to paint one of the most amazing masterpieces. This is the earth. Just sitting there like that. I find encouragement in this passage because even in this dark, this barren, this lonely place, the spirit of the Lord is still hovering over it. Ooh, gives me chills. Gives me chills. There is nowhere you can go to hide from his presence. Where can I go from his presence? If I send up to the heavens, you're there. If I go down to Shiloh, you're there. God is absolutely everywhere, and his spirit is covering the earth. I felt like I had to park here just for a second before I get into the passage because you need to know something 
that no matter how dark your life is feeling, how lonely your life is feeling, how barren you are feeling, how alone you are feeling, the Spirit of the Lord is with you. And he is your ever-present help in time of need. Everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He is there with you. All you need to do is extend your hand. Woo! I could park it there, and we could go home. I could, I could sit right there. If all I told you is God is with you and his spirit is with you, all you have to do is call him. That's enough. Give me the number. Give me your digits, spirit. I want to call you. Some of you need the spirit right now. Some of you need his peace right now. Some of you need his joy right now. He's just a call away. Why don't you stop and ask him? He'll meet you here today. Are you having a hard time focusing? He'll meet you here today. Are you having a hard time feeling like you're valued? He'll meet you here today. Amen. You guys ready for the sermon today? Am I preaching too early? Am I preaching? All right. I felt like that was, somebody needed to hear that this morning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. We're going to speed read through this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Skip to verse 5. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Whew. I'm going to have a hard time not preaching this. All right, keep going, Jordan. Keep going, Pastor Jordan. All right. That's day one. I want you to note some of the things. There was evening, there was morning, first day. Next. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Boom. God's working. God's grinding. He's getting it done. Okay? Verse 9. And then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let gr dry ground appear, and it was so. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants bearing seeds, I've preached this sermon before, according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it, and according to his kind, and God saw it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the third day. Keep going. God's working. Day four. God said, let there be light. And the expanse of the light separated the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark the seasons and days and years. And there was evening, there was morning. That was the fourth day. And God said, let water teem with living creatures. And let birds fly above the earth and across the expanse of the sky. And there was evening, there was morning. This is the fifth day. Okay. told you we're speed reading. We're just getting a snapshot. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind. Livestock, creatures that move around the ground, and wild animals, and each according to their kind. And it was so. And then God said, let us make man in our image. And let them... Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over the earth, and over all the creatures that move on the ground. Do you see what God's doing? Now, we've gotten to the sixth day, and he's giving man leadership, man and woman, okay? Rule over the earth. You got responsibilities. God works, 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 works. You work. You see it? And then, put a cherry on top of this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. So he's making them in his image. So he shows six days, work, 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 work. Rule over the land. I'm going to make you in my likeness. And it says, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea birds of the air, every other living thing that moves on the ground. And then God said, I will give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath in it, I give you green plants for food, and it was so. God saw that all he was made was very good. 
It was good before, it was good before, and now it's very good. I love that. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. There's that phrase again, there was evening, there was morning, sixth day. If you need to underline it, you can underline it. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. God finished it. Now check this out. We're going to do two more verses. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he was doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that which he has done. I want to talk to you today. My sermon title for the day is Work Hard, Play Hard. Work Hard, Play Hard. Or if I was telling this to my daughter Eliana, I would say it's time for nun night. That would be my sermon title. Okay? Work Hard, Play Hard. We see this progression in the Genesis account. Work, 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 hard work. Imagine all that God created into one day. We just read it like, oh, God created the dirt. But he had to create so much more than just the dirt, right? He had to create the molecules that were involved. He had to create how fertilizer would work with the dirt and, and everything. Like, God did a lot of work. And let me tell you something. As an American culture, I'll tell you what. We are a hardworking nation. It's kind of what we're known for, right? This American dream, like, I'm just going to be such a hard worker. And, and our society is kind of set up to work hard. I think that's one of the most biblical things about American culture. And one of the things I actually like about American culture is that, is that we are designed to work really hard, be successful, and we have created systems that rewards working hard. Don't believe me? What about overtime? You're going to work over 40 hours? I'm going to pay you double. It's incentive to keep working, right? We have overtime. We have harder jobs often pay more. If you want to make over $100,000 as an electrician, go climb up on the top of electric poles and change those electric lights, right? Like the harder jobs cost more because not a lot of people want to do it. We reward hard work in this society. Or maybe think about it like degrees, okay? All the hardest degrees to achieve in school oftentimes pay the most, okay? You want to you wanna make a lot of money? Go be a doctor. Go be an anesthesiologist. You can make millions of dollars, but it takes a lot of work. Am I right? If you're willing to put in the work, you can make the money. You know, in our country, this blew my mind, we have 18.6 million millionaires in this country. 18.6 million millionaires. I didn't say 18.6 million, 18.6 millionaires. I said 18.6 million millionaires. That is way farther than any other nation in the world. We have 40% of the world's millionaires in our country. The next closest is China with 10%. And after that, it drastically drops. There's like 3%, 2%, a bunch of 1% less than 1%. America is set up for working hard and making money. Unless you think, oh, these are just people that generationally gain money. That's actually not the case. 80% of the millionaires in this country are first-time millionaires and didn't receive an inheritance. So our country has set up this system that if you work hard, you can be rewarded. Put in 60, 70, 80 hours a week. You can make some money. Somebody else won't be willing to do it. You can take their spot. And while we have this huge success rate in our country of all this, we also are one of the nations with the highest level of anxiety disorders. 20% of Americans are diagnosed with anxiety disorders. One in five are di just diagnosed. It's probably more that actually have different anxiety disorders. But 20% of people are struggling with anxiety disorders. This tells me that while there is some really good aspects to our hard working in this nation, there is also sinfulness that can come from it. Idolatry. Now, I'm just warning you right now, because the, the message that I'm preaching today, 
It's going to butt against some of your ideologies. It's going to butt against what it means to be American, even at its core. But hear me out. What I'm saying is not that hard work is not important, but it's important to know when to work hard and when to play hard. And this is going to be incredibly important when we're building a foundation as a church and in our personal lives. Because if you don't, it's, it will lead to burnout. It will lead to toiling and lack of fruitfulness in your own life. And this is what we see. And so when, what we see here is in verse, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. It says, as God saw that all he made was very good, and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. And it says this in verse 2. By the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing. And so the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Even God of the universe, do you think God needed to rest? Like seriously, I just told you before anything was just God. Nothing is impossible for God. You think our, our God had to take a nap? No, we learn in context by the next verse. It says, and God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy. Why did he make it, make it holy? Because he rested from all the work of creating. There is something holy about biblical rest. There is something holy that God has intended when he created this seventh day. Now, I want to look biblically at three different categories this morning. Three different types of rest that God is calling us all into. One is daily rest, second one is weekly rest, and the last one is yearly rest. If you're taking notes, this would be a good, good little note thing. I know some of you really like the notes. Could you pull up uh, verse 31 again? Let's start with daily rest. Did you notice something when we read through this first chapter of the passage? It says, there was evening and then there was morning. Don't you think it's a little odd that God started the day out with evening? We start our days out with morning, right? Oh, I'm up. Got to get my coffee and get my work in. Imagine how different it would be if we oriented our days starting with the evening. Meaning, when the sun sets, the work is done. Meaning, when the sun is down, the, day is, the next day is beginning. And isn't it interesting that in God's idea of a daily rhythm, it starts with rest? Because we don't work for rest, we work from rest. That's how God intended it to be. Let me repeat that again. We don't work for rest, meaning I just got to get to the weekend, I just got to get to the weekend. What God intends for us is to be filled up and to enter our week, God, I'm ready to work today. I'm ready to be, I'm filled up today, God. I started my day off with rest. This is what God has intended us. So that means when the sun comes down, it's time to put the work down. We can always find more work to do. The daily rest is needed for us for recharging. I'm going to throw an R word on each one of these, okay? So if you like notes, you can put this down. The daily rest is just for recharging, This is for us to plug in, to get filled up again. So when you get home, it's not time to work anymore. It's time to be home. It's time to rest. It's time to be with your family. It's time to be with your friends. It's time to spend spend time in the Word, spend time with your kiddos. Don't work so hard to achieve a life that you never get to enjoy. That's not what God intended for us. It's like This will probably be, uh, how many of you have a smartphone? Nowadays, I feel like almost everybody does, okay? Here's the thing. Have you, how many of you charge your smartphone in the evening when you go to bed? I do that too, okay? Have you ever had those nights where you plug in your phone and you realize, like, the charger wasn't plugged in or something, and you wake up, and it's, like, thorn in my flesh, like, oh, because you're on this low battery mode, and you're, like, everything's slow and stuff, and so what are you doing? Throughout the day, you're just trying to plug it in. While I'm in the car, I'll use my car charger. When I'm at work, I'll plug it in here for a second. Hey, do you have a, you're at a coffee shop. Hey, can I borrow our phone charger? And we're trying to find rest in all these little areas when we should have just refreshed at the end of the day. When we should have just recharged at night. And 
when I get to nighttime, let me, let me just tell you this. Scientifically, there, the number one correlation to long life is sleep. In fact, dietary stuff, like there are so many studies, it's hard to figure out a correlation between dietary things and long life. Some people are like vegetables only. Some people are like meat only. Some people say, well, you do this and you do this and you do this and you do the hokey pokey and then you try this and, then, and you drink this smoothie on this day and this, this. And, and, and like there's some here, but it's hard to find correlations because there's so many other things. One thing that we are scientifically sure of is that there is a correlation to long life and sleep. So if you're staying up late to work hard, just try to get some more hours in life, you're going to spend it later. So why not just rest the way that God intended you to? This leads to heart disease, diabetes, all these different things from just not getting your sleep. They've, they've proven that under six hours is detrimental for your life. Getting six to seven hours still brings complications. What we really need is, on average, over eight hours of sleep. I know that's hard. It's hard to do it with our culture, but... But that's what God has got, that's the way God intended our systems. This is a principle. And so work finishes when the sun goes down. For some of you out there, your stay-at-home moms, it doesn't, I, I tell you what, it doesn't feel like the, the work stops when the sun goes down. Men, this is where we need to step in. Okay, take a moment in your car, take a breather, take another sip of coffee, go in there, relieve, relieve mama. Okay, she's been working hard that day too. So we, God calls us to daily rest. Second one, and this is incredibly important, weekly rest. This is what God said. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he was doing, and on the seventh day, he rested from work. This is something that we've kind of gotten away from as a society. We keep pushing the boundaries. It's kind of like Black Friday, right? Black Friday used to be Black Friday, now it's Black Thursday, now it's Thursday morning. Now it's like Wednesday we have the 20% off deals and then the real deals kick in on, you know. It's like, and that's exactly how it is. Like, and we used to be like that with the Sabbath. Everything was closed on Sunday, okay? It's not, not the case anymore. I heard somebody complaining, man, I just wish the Friendly Fox was open so we could have coffee. And I, and I was like, they need rest too. Go, go have coffee on your porch, it's a daily rest. And it says this, Jesus says this in Mark 2, chapter 2, verse 27. The Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. This is incredibly important to understand. God gave this day for you. He built in a day in your, your week for you. Now, if, if the daily rhythm was for recharging... The weekly one is for realigning. Realigning your week, realigning your heart. You know, me and my wife, um, a couple weeks ago, I, I, let me just tell you this. I, I try my best to not preach something that I'm not willing to practice my own. So a couple weeks before this, I knew this series was, I knew this sermon was coming. I told my wife, my, well, actually, my wife brought it up to me. She said, we need to get in better rhythms. She was the one who brought it up. Before, before I give myself the credit here, okay? And so we started implementing the Sabbath, and we started looking at these different resources. What do people do for Sabbath and stuff? We started doing things like we started putting a, a candle on our table, and Friday evening we light the candle, and the girls love it. Our little girls, they just love it, you know? And we, we set the mood, and we have a fancy dinner, and we just rest. Like last time we had steaks. It was great. My wife can cook, too. She makes a good steak. Not that... That chewy uh, apple, Applebee's kind of steaks, you know. I'm just kidding. Applebee's has some good ones, okay? She makes some good ones. Obviously, I'm not endorsed by anyone up here. <laughs> the Sabbath is a day intended for restoration, for healing, for realignment. That's why Jesus healed on the Sabbath. That's what it's for. And we've been... Uh, as a family, we've been getting in these weekly rhythms, and it has changed our family dynamic radically, really fast. Like, everything has shifted. We feel rested. I asked my wife, do you feel rested? Do you need to go somewhere? Do you need to, uh, do, uh, do I feel rested? And we, we try to find this weekly rhythm, and it has brought life to our family. Now, here's the thing. 
I know what you're thinking. A whole day of the week for not working? I truly believe God intended us for this. But as a family, maybe you start with just an evening. Maybe you just start low, like say, hey, we're just going to take the evening off. We're going to disconnect from technology. Just know it doesn't need to be this structured, like, we have to do this. Because me and my wife got into this, like, oh, you can't do this on the Sabbath. You can't do this. Like, we need to make sure our phones are face down at all times and stuff like that. And that's, Jesus spoke against that. This is not supposed to be an idolatrous day for you. This is supposed to be a day of rest for you to enjoy. And sometimes we've got to make room for that. You know, it's funny that we chose the seventh-day model that God chose, that it's adopted all around the world. And it's not because other people didn't try to adopt this. You know, in uh, communist Russia, they tried to implement a five-day Sabbath week. That didn't go over well. Or the French Revolution tried to do a 10-day week, and that didn't work well either. It, the seventh always persevered. It always held on because we need that day. God has intended that day. Now, we as a family, we take this from Friday to Saturday. I would encourage you, find a day that works for you and your family, and take that day off. Disconnect from work. Don't even have your emails on. Whatever work you do, unplug, realign your hearts, and enter into the week. That's the weekly one. The last one is the yearly rhythm. God has also intended us to have yearly rhythms. For the Jews, they were yearly holidays that they would have. You can look throughout the Old Te Testament, like Yom Kippur and all these different things. They had these yearly times. And one thing I've realized when I look at these is these days actually are not intended for you to get rested. They're intended for you to remember. This is the third R for this. God created these days to remember his faithfulness, to remember what he's done. And so if you are working, 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 working so hard, and then finally you make it to vacation, and you leave for vacation, and you come back home, and you wonder why you're not rested, the yearly rhythms were not intended for your rest. The weekly ones were. The daily ones were. The yearly ones are for remembering. So me and my wife have made some yearly traditions. We made our anniversary time. We block that off, and we remember God's faithfulness in our marriage. We remember uh, the things that he worked through in our hearts together, and we, we make almost like a monument for that. We, we remember these moments. We also have another one. We call it the Illumi Family Summit. We borrowed this from another uh, a family that does this. And, and this is like we invite the girls in, and as they get older, we want to go out and we want to we wanna go camping or do like a retreat kind of thing, and we... All we do is we remember God's faithfulness as a family. We bring them in with this and yearly have these, these, holidays, these holidays, these remembrances. That's what we intend for the year long. We don't intend for our year holidays to take up the rest time for us. In fact, even on our honeymoon, me and my wife took rest days. We spent the whole, like we went to uh, Paris and Portugal and Spain. We had an amazing honeymoon. It was awesome. We saw a great parts of the world. But we also had days, even though we were in amazing Portugal, right? Had a, a, a hotel right on the beach. We spent days where, we had a day where we spent the entire day at home, not leaving the place. We watched, binge watched all the Avenger movies. And we just, we're like, we're not going to get up. We're not going to go places. We're not going to work hard. We're going to order our food in. Like, we're going to bring, like, we're just going to chill out for the entire day. Like, our, our weekly rhythms didn't stop when we went on vacation. They just emphasized our vacation. And they actually made us filled because we took two and a half weeks off for our honeymoon, and we made sure to have those rhythms in there. That was our rest. We didn't, we didn't use our yearly rhythms for rest. And I want to encourage you, as a family, to consider these kinds of things. So we have we daily, weekly, yearly rhythms. If we don't start implementing rest at the beginning of all this, before we start doing things, if we don't make a rhythm in our lives, it's going to lead us to burnout. Many of you have experienced ministry burnout, where the first thing you did when you came after uh, work, you came, you came to the church and you helped out the church, and you did various things, and right now you're just like, I'm tired. Of course you're tired. 
That's not how God intended us to be. But once we get on a rhythm, once we get on a schedule, once we get these patterns of rest in our life, we will begin to feel fresh. Now, here's the question. All right, you told me that I need to make this space. Now, how do we rest? How do we do this? Now, I need a, I'm, I'm going to have a, a, a volunteer come up here. All right, I need my buddy Danny come up here. I haven't told him what I'm going to use him for. This is probably one of the, the funnest sermon illustrations here. All right, Danny. This is my, my friend Danny. All right, Danny is a strapping young man, right? Very strong, nice pecs, good, very strong. What I need you to do is I need you to drop and give me 10 push-ups. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, now stop. Now, how did that feel, Danny? How did that feel? Okay. I mean, if we stopped and we rested and we took some places, if we took some time, you'd feel really great, right? But the problem is when we don't rest, we, we get tired. Can you give me ten more? Eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 18, 19, 20. Now, here's the thing. I mean, Danny, we can stop now and get rest, but um, I'm trying to prove this point here. I I need you to give me 10 more. Actually, just keep going until you stop. Let's see how, what are you, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. How many do you think he gets? 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. How are you feeling? 33, 34. Oh, it's the plank, too. I mean, you could have done more if I hadn't had you just kind of stand. So he's just, oh, he's feeling burnout. He's feeling failure, right? He's hitting a wall, right? Okay, Danny, let's stop here. Let's stop here. I know you can do 20 more, but I'm not, uh, don't worry. I'm going I'm to make sure to, to you know, show, not show off your strength here, okay? So, Danny, yeah, can we give him a round of applause? Okay. Now, Danny, you and me, we've been good buddies, but we've also been good workout partners together, right? Okay. Now, Two things are really important, I think, when it comes to rest and recovery for working out. The first thing is, it's just taking time off, right? <laughs> right? Like, we learned pretty quickly, like, we, we were working out every single day, and we realized we weren't giving our muscles enough time to recover. And because of that, we were feeling exhausted, and we were burning out, and we were getting injured. And that's what will happen when we work, 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 work. So rest is the first part of it. If you want to feel fresh, you need to rest. Now, but, but what, what was the other part of working out? Because there was one thing when we started working out, we were just resting and that was fine. And uh, we were feeling rested and fresh, but we weren't getting stronger. What, what kind of helped us get stronger? Chipotle. Okay. More, more specifically, what is Chipotle in there? Food. Food. <laughs> right? N- <laughs> That's right. That's right, brother. Amen. Food. We learned that nutrition is incredibly important to rest. If you want to feel fresh, you just rest. But if you want to be fruitful, it also matters what you're taking in. It also matters what you're bringing in. Because the world, this is a principle God established. And the world can take rest days like this and feel fresh. But God has not intended us to just be fresh. He said be fruitful and multiply. In order to be fruitful, it's important what we take in too. It's not just important what we, what we do. So, we know this. This is the good part. We know this. Jesus says this. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. So it's not just about taking time off. It's also about abiding with Jesus. Hear me out here. You can be fresh by taking a day off, but to be fruitful, you must abide with Jesus. Now, speaking of fruitful, I'm going to help you out here. I was hoping that you wouldn't say Chipotle, you'd say a smoothie, but I'm going to make you a smoothie here, Danny, because you don't just do push-ups for me, and then I don't bless you, okay? So we got, we got a smoothie here. Now, it's important that while we're making a smoothie, my wife said, if I get anything on the stage, she didn't finish that sentence. So <laughs> I, I'm going to respect her for that. 
Almost stayed there. Okay. So, hold the mic for me. So, first thing we need to do if we want to be fruitful, okay, a lot of puns here. Okay, it's coming. All right. We that was very punny. Oh. That was pretty good. We need to get filled up, so maybe it's spending time in prayer. Spending time listening from the Lord. We're hearing from his word, and we're filling ourselves up while we're resting. Now, when I make a smoothie, I don't just put fruit in it, okay? We also got to put milk in it. I brought some almond milk. Brought some almond milk. All men? <laughs> Told you it's coming. And I make sure I seek him and I get filled up. Now, now when we're working out, Danny, and we're making a smoothie, we got, we got berries in here. We want to be fruitful, so we're spending time with God. We're getting filled up with his spirit, the milk represents. Now, that's, though, not going to give us recovery. What else do we need to get recovery here? What else would you throw in that smoothie to, to, to get the muscles where you need to be? Protein some protein power, okay? You got to feed the muscles, okay? So I got some protein here. This is whey protein because Jesus is the way, amen? Hey. You hold the mic. So we take some of Jesus and we get filled up. Got a little bit on the stage. A vacuum can clean that. And so while we're resting, we're not just resting. We're getting filled with the Spirit of God, too. And what this will do is this is what brings us to having gains. You can take that. You can drink that the rest of your service. Give him a hand, a round of applause. So those push-ups, you drink that, next time you'll be able to do more push-ups. And that's the way that God intended this work, is that actually you work and work and work because you want to be more fruitful, but we get to a point where we end up toiling, and we overwork, and we don't see the fruit that we desire in our hearts. And, and I will tell you what, I have found that the moment that I start resting and abiding with the Father, he makes my work more productive. He makes my work more fruitful. He shows up in amazing ways, and I'm not toiling anymore. I'm feeling renewed in my spirit. I'm feeling fresh. My muscles feel great. I feel good because I'm abiding with God, and he is doing all the heavy lifting. He said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. I almost put an egg yoke in here, Danny. That would have been terrible. And learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. See, see, when we just take time off, that may rest us physically, but Jesus brings rest for your soul. Ooh, in a refreshed soul, when you see a broken soul, when you see one that is spent and tired, it's almost worse than the body. That's one of the things when I see uh, people in the hospital and I'm ministering to them, I'm praying for their body, but I'm also ministering to their soul. Because I realize a broken soul in a hospital is even worse than just a broken body. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And then, goes to the next chapter, it says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry. They began to gra grab some heads of grain and eat them because Jesus gave us the seed bearing plants, right? They're eating. And it says this, when the Pharisees saw him, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing something unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus says this, the son of man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Sabbath. And so, Lest you leave this place and you just take Saturdays off and you just try to put a Band-Aid on something, you must come to Jesus if you want to find rest. 
or else your soul will never find rest. Your soul will always be in a dry and thirsty land. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads? There's many in, us, in this room in, with us that are, that are not taking that daily rest that God has prescribed for his people. I just want you to know there's grace for that, and it's not too late. It's not too late. Listen, your job, when you leave it someday, they will just fill somebody else in that position. It's a job. And you are doing good things, but it cannot become an idol. Your work cannot become an idol in your life. Or else you will get down the road and not know your kids or your family. And so maybe this is you. God is the restorer of all things. Praise the Lord. He redeems all things. Praise the Lord. It's not too late. Find that daily rest for your soul. Maybe it's a weekly rest day. Maybe you're just go, go, go. 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Working every single day. Working hard. You're making good money. That's great. But you want to be more fruitful? Give God that space. Give God that day. Or maybe it's just a yearly thing. Maybe you need, maybe it's time to make some traditions for yourself or for your family or for your, you know, making, setting apart these days where, you know what, we're going to go up to the mountains and we're going to remember God's faithfulness. We're going to go camping and make a tent. We're going to, or maybe that's too much work. Maybe you just want to get a hotel. Or maybe you want to camp in your backyard. Doesn't matter. What matters is you set aside that time for the Lord. Jesus, you promised. You said, come all who are weary, and you'll give us rest. So God, as we come, well, can we find that rest? Show us that rest. This burden's too heavy. God, I, I pray that you would teach us that as we make space for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me? It says this, Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. And unless the Lord watches the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In vain, you rise early and you stay up late, toiling for food to eat, but he grants sleep to those he loves. Let the Lord bless you and go before you in these days that you find rest in him. We'll see you guys later. God bless.